<laughs> Hi folks. Hey, welcome to Scott Base. I've been undertaking research in Antarctica now for nearly 30 years, so I've seen a few changes. And perhaps the most dramatic, though, are the increasing complexity of the scientific questions being asked by the scientists themselves, and the advances in technology and skill to answer those questions. And indeed, the degree of collaboration that's now required to answer some of those really complex scientific questions. My own interest in Antarctica began with a fairly rudimentary epiphany as an undergraduate geology major. And that was that an ice cube on the bottom of the world was not going to be very compatible with a warming planet. It had to melt. And if it did, where did all that water go? And it's a pretty significant ice cube, 26 quadrillion tonnes. That's 26,000 million million, for those of you who are <laughs> counting the zeros. <laughs> and that's enough to raise sea level around the globe by as much as 60 metres. So I started looking through the geological record for evidence of past intervals of warmth and higher sea level. The journey took me around New Zealand to South America and, of course, here in Antarctica. And turned out not to be a very quick job. <laughs> So I've teamed up with a lot of people along the way and we've unearthed evidence from beneath Antarctica's ice sheets and oceans that indicate past intervals of warmth. One of the challenges of working here in Antarctica is that evidence is hard to find. It's either under the ice or under the water around Antarctica. But along the way, we've unearthed quite a lot about this continent. Its ice sheets have expanded and retreated on a periodic basis as the planet has cooled and warmed. And the ice sheets change more dramatically than you might expect. Just a few degrees of warming of the planet results in loss of between 2 and 20% of Antarctica's ice sheets. That's partly because warming of the planet is not uniform. The poles tend to warm at more than double the average rate. And think on this, a metre of sea level rise comes from only 2% change in the Antarctic ice sheet. And a metre of sea level rise displaces 100 million people around the planet. Now, when Antarctica's ice sheets cool and expand and retreat, the ocean follows suit. That's because Antarctica is cooling the ocean and driving ocean circulation. And atmosphere and climate follows as well, because the temperature gradient from the equator to the pole causes atmosphere to reorganise. It turns out that Antarctica is this huge flywheel that translates just small changes in warmth of the planet into significant global changes in circulation, sea level and climate. No matter how you look at it, small changes in Antarctica have big impact on the rest of the planet. Obviously the ice sheets have a great deal of inertia, so you might think that these changes are slow. But it turns out from the geological evidence not to be the case. As the Earth warmed out of the last glaciation between 10,000 and 20,000 years ago, it did so in a stepwise fashion. Long intervals of relatively stable or slowly changing climate and sea level punctuated by significant episodes of melt, with sea level rising by as much as 4 metres per 100 years in some of those periodic intervals of melt. The other thing we've learnt along the way is that past levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have a huge effect on the planet. Low levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide result in relatively stable ice sheets. High levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide, less stable ice sheets. The Antarctic ice sheets have varied 
between 200 and 300 parts per million. The ice sheets have grown and retreated on a periodic basis. But 400 parts per million seems to be a critical threshold. Above that, the geological record reveals significant loss in the Antarctic ice sheet and sea level rise, as much as 10 metres. And above 500 parts per million, as much as 20 metres rise in global sea level. So, as the Earth passed through 400 parts per million atmospheric carbon dioxide a year or so ago, at a rate not previously seen in the geological record, we were left wondering, how long would it take for Antarctica and its ice sheets to catch up? The risk here is not in what we know, it's in what we don't know. The knowledge gap leads to uncertainty, and that uncertainty makes it difficult for us to develop plans or take action. It's further exacerbated by the potential enormity of Antarctica's impact on the globe. But challenges only seem enormous when we don't know the pathway through. Mountains are unscalable until someone works out how to get to the top. So what we're talking about here is the unknown pathway. The geological record has a fairly low resolution. We, we have a pretty good idea where the system will come into equilibrium as the planet warms. What we don't know is the pathway to get there, the steps, the thresholds, the changes in rate on our way to a warming planet. Now, obviously, solving this problem can be done pretty easily if we develop a comprehensive understanding of the ocean ice climate system here in Antarctica. But we can make significant progress around the edges where different parts of the system come into contact, where Antarctica connects with the Southern Ocean, where the ocean connects with the ice and where the atmosphere connects with the ocean and the ice. At the edges, we can learn about how one part of the system drives change in another part of the system. At the edges, we can learn how indicative change in one part of the system might be of the system of a whole. It's pretty easy to fall into the trap of observable change in one part of the system driving our whole understanding of the whole system. Take, for example, growing ice, sea ice, around Antarctica. It may well indicate a cooling continent. But not if the source of the sea ice is the melting fresh water from beneath Antarctica's ice shelves. I've undertaken quite a lot of work in the geological record using sediment cores. And the whole aim of that has been about trying to understand the rates of change and trying to bring down our resolution of understanding of the geological record. It turns out to be a pretty complex system. But one thing I've learned from my geological training, and that is that past life is indicative of ocean and climate condition. Change in environment changes the life. Now, on long timescales, species come and go. But on shorter timescales, populations move and population health changes. The life integrates across the environment. And the life integrates through time. So life is indicative of trend rather than variability in the system. What do I mean by trend and variability? Well, variability is the backwards and forwards, the natural backwards and forwards in the system about an average state. And trend is change in that average state. If we pick up, well, it takes a lot to measure the difference between trend and variability, a lot of measurements through quite a period of time. If we pick up a change in trend, then we need to be able to attribute it to a cause. That way we can work out what's driving the system and the change. Now, if we take a whole of ecosystem approach, we can do that. And that's because species in one part of the ecosystem 
respond to different parts of the environment. That way, you can work out what's driving change in your ecosystem. Now, one thing I'm working on at the moment is trying to piece together the modern change in Antarctica from a series of long-term ecological research and monitoring points around Antarctica to try and pick up that modern change. And one place we're interested in is Cape Adair, some 700 kilometres north of here at Scott Base. It's pretty close to the Southern Ocean at the northern edge of the Ross Sea. It's also home to the largest Adelie penguin rookery in Antarctica, somewhere upwards of a million birds. And offshore, there are kelp forests, not seen further south here in the Ross Sea. And at first glance, the water column seems to be an extension of the Southern Ocean onto the Antarctic Shelf. So it's a great spot to pick up the influence of the Southern Ocean in Antarctica. It's also one of the few points in mainland Antarctica that extend into the newly agreed Ross Sea Marine Protected Area. So again, another spot to get some baseline understanding of ecosystem health. It's a difficult place to get to. No one will argue with that. But it's an important place to understand the impact of warming in the Southern Ocean into Antarctica. Another place that's important to look at is the subantarctic. Islands around the northern perimeter of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current with their own iconic species that are also responding to environmental change. But in this case, propagating north out of Antarctica to the rest of the world. So, can we actually do anything about this? Obviously, we need to solve this knowledge gap to be able to make informed decisions and do something more about our future. But you know, we can actually act on what we already know. We know that the planet is warming year upon year. We know that atmospheric carbon dioxide levels and other greenhouse gases have contributed to that warming over the past few years. Atmospheric CO2 is increasing at half to 1% per annum. So surely it's possible to turn that around, half to 1%. And we can all do something about that. It's going to be made a lot easier if we understand more about our own carbon footprint, what it is that we use, what it is that we're buying that contributes to this increase in carbon dioxide. That's what the carbon trading system was all about, trying to work out the origin of our carbon and where it ended up in the atmosphere. But the reality is we all need to do some saving. That's what the discussion in Paris was about. So we're talking about it, we're just not quite doing it yet. There's a bit of a standoff here between governments and individuals. As individuals, we kind of rely on government to have these big questions sorted out and a plan in hand. But the government of the day is concerned with the issues of the individuals today. That's why they get elected, and that's why they stay elected. So we're waiting for government, and they're waiting for us. Let's break the cycle. That's what the New Zealand Antarctic Research Institute is all about, brokering a public-private partnership to undertake research on some of these more challenging questions that transcend geopolitical boundaries. That's the problem with climate change. No one country is going to solve it on its own. It's going to take each and every one of us to make a difference together. Thank you.